Brilliant. Well, thank you for joining us. We are Westminster Digital. We are a digital public affairs company. So we work with um, a lot of corporates and charities, ambassadors um, to help connect with people online. Um, we're going to be doing two webinars. So the first one obviously today and the second one um, on Friday, which is about working with digital agencies. Um, I'm Tom Dixon, I'm the Managing Director, and I'm joined by Charlie Coopersmith, our Head of Production, and Charlie Messenger, one of our digital strategists and producers. Um, and today we're going to be talking about why social media is not your digital shop window. Um, so there's this kind of antiquated idea that your website or social media should be your digital shop window. Um, we actually want to turn that on its head and think about how social media can help you create a community, an online community um, to engage with um, and how that's a much more effective way of viewing social media to connect with key stakeholders or generate sales or whatever it is that your business does. Um, we have a couple of polls and I think we're going to start off with one. Um, so what do you mostly use social media for? And I will pull up the poll here. What do you mostly use social media for? Um, and if you guys want to let us know, um, it'll just help us shape the discussion. So I think I've launched that now. Let me know if there's any problems. Oh, perfect, people are already voting. We'll give you a second to let the results come in. Awesome. Okay, that seems like about three quarters of people have voted. I'll give you a second more. Okay, so I can see that um, mostly it seems like it's for selling your product or service um, or fostering online community, which is great. That's what we're going to be talking about today. Um, a few people talking about customer service and a few people talking about lobbying or public affairs. Um, so when we talk about it, let's focus first on that on that first answer um, people that are trying to sell their products or services and this is where we really want to move away from the idea that social media is your digital shop window um, because there's a lot of companies online that get this wrong and they use social media or they use their website just to display their products display their services like a shop window um, but actually this is um, proven to be not particularly successful way of selling products um, and actually, what we want to do is, is use it for, for instance, like the, the, uh, the people that responded to customer service, using social media for customer service is great. Um, the people that um, responded fostering online community, again, creating that community of uh, potential customers or potential stakeholders um, is super important. Um, so I've got some examples of companies that are you know, really good at doing that. So at the, at the top we have Boohoo. Boohoo this, now this post is a what's inside my wardrobe. Um, they've got an influencer to talk about what's inside her wardrobe, but this isn't particularly sales content. So it's, it, although she's wearing Boohoo clothes, it's not particularly salesy. And, and the purpose of the, the video is uh, content that they know the Boohoo community will like. So they know that their Instagram followers in this instance, they know that their Instagram followers want to see what's inside an influencer's wardrobe. So they provide them with that content. They genuinely engage with this, um, with this community. Um, and that means that when they do come to sell stuff, their community will naturally come to them and, and buy it. And we'll talk a little bit later about how that turns into conversions or how that can help with lobbying. I know there's a few people that, um, on the poll that said they were um, in the more public affairs space. So we'll talk about that. Um, we've got down here the Royal Academy of Arts. Um, so again, it's not salesy content. It's not come to this exhibition, um, but it's just shareable content. We shared over 30,000 times on Twitter. Um, so this kind of content that is um, for your community, for your community to share, for your community to comment on and like, it's a bit jokey, it's a bit more fun. Um, will help you build this online community. It'll help you stop thinking about social media as your digital shop window, just to display your products and services, and more as a place to genuinely engage um, and connect with your potential customers or stakeholders. Um, then we've got PlayStation on the bottom right. Again, they've done a fantastic job of creating this online community. They use their um, social media a lot for like updates about uh, various games or apps that they've got coming out. Um, they use their social media to create discussions around games and apps or have um, 
streamers or, or gamers talking about whatever they're playing. But again, it's the kind of content that is not particularly, it's very rare to see PlayStation, um, especially on their organic feeds, actually like selling anyone anything, but they just create this community. Um, they're one of the most successful um, Twitter pages, uh, like retail Twitter pages, um, because they're not so um, just displaying their products and services. They're really thinking about how can they connect with their online community. Um, one of the things, I mean, so we look at Microsoft. Microsoft um, reported last year they boosted productivity by 38% through socially prospecting for leads. Socially prospecting is this idea of creating an online community and allowing the customer to come to you. Um, and and uh, one of the things that Microsoft and PlayStation um, are particularly good at is responding to customers online. So it's not just about um, not just about your uh, strategy in terms of putting out content, but social media is both active and reactive. Um, so at the bottom, you see when companies engage and respond to customer service requests over social media, those customers spend 20% to 40% more with the company. Um, now, this is really interesting because there are a lot of companies that are getting a lot better at this. A lot of the fast food chains um, who have digital agencies like ourselves um, in them um, are do excelling at this um, really, really well. But responding to customer service over social media, it never before um, before social media was it possible for a customer to genuinely um, connect with or speak to, you know, KFC as a brand or Burger King as a brand. Burger King, of course, having um, the most liked Twitter posts uh, of any uh, retail company ever. Um, and so, and, and so, uh, this idea that that uh, social media is is for connecting with people is amazing because people genuinely send in their complaints, and Burger King genuinely responds to them on an individual level. So you can really connect with people, and that idea of connection is something that Charlie and Charlie will speak about in a little bit. Um, and it's not just about sales. Um, we work with, uh, as we said before, government departments, also some politicians. Um, as well as all the corporate stuff um, and charities, think tanks, trade associations that we work with. Um, so just exam some examples of the public affairs kind of stuff. Um, I know there's about a quarter of you that said um, that you use social media for lobbying or public affairs. Um, so here's a campaign we did with Weatherspoons and the Adam Smith Institute about uh, freezing beer duty. Um, and, and local pubs and Charlie Messenger is just going to speak about that video a bit later. The Visa Great British High Street campaign. Again, it's not sales, but it's it's more public affairs -y, But uh, uh, social media is such a great way to connect with uh, politicians or uh, people you're trying to have influence on. Um, just the uh, debt collectors um, and Lloyd's Banking Group in the bottom right. Again, talking about uh, women in Westminster. So it's a real uh, like. Uh, kind of CS, a CSR message, a real corporate social responsibility message. Um, but all of these, um, especially the ASI one, you know, used for lobbying. Um, we talk a lot about direct and indirect lobbying. So we often run campaigns where we use digital content to target directly to members of parliament or, um, you know, government departments, whoever, you, whoever some of our clients are trying to influence but we also do a lot of indirect campaigns where we go and launch a national campaign um, such that people will you know get really uh, passionate about it and then contact their local MP that way and we call that indirect lobbying um, and that's definitely something um, we can touch on later I should have said as well there will be about 15 to 20 minutes for questions at the end um, so certainly anyone who has um, you know responded to the polls or anyone that has any questions for us do feel free to uh, to throw them out throughout this, um, but also at the end, and we'll be happy to respond. We've left a lot of time for that. So um, we wanted to show you uh, a couple of videos that we've created to talk through the kind of creative process and talk about this difference between the digital shop window and your social media community. Um, this first video, I know there's a couple of government departments um, in the Business Innovation District. Um, and so this was for the Ministry of Housing, Communities and Local Government. Uh, they came to us and they said, we want to do a, a year in review video. Um, and we said, okay, but you know, you're not going to be able to connect with people just by talking statistics. Why don't we take your four key policies and we'll do an interview with real people 
and find out how your policies have influenced them and, and changed their lives. So this is a, a section of that year review video. Um, it's with a, there's a child called Caden um, who benefited from the shielding, the uh, food parcels over coronavirus. Um, and this is Caden and his mother talking about how that helped. And you'll see that the idea for this wasn't to drill home you know, necessarily the statistics of, of how policies have helped, but more to tell uh, a sort of story that people genuinely um, could get emotionally attached to and um, uh, did in fact share and like um, and uh, engage with on social media. In March, as the country went into lockdown, we made the decision to shield the most vulnerable people in society sending millions of parcels of food and essential supplies to those who needed them the most. And we wanted to make it clear that while they may have been at home shielding, they were not alone. My name's Leanne. Um, for five months during the coronavirus, we were having to shield um, because Caden has cystic fibrosis. If the government hadn't provided the food boxes throughout um, the lockdown. Um, it would have been completely unbearable. I would have had to have obviously gone out to the stores where people were panic buying, obviously masses of people, and I would have potentially been bringing the virus back into the house, which could have potentially put Caden in a very perilous condition. Um, so the fact that we got these food parcels and we had that every week without fail, it was just a huge, huge relief. And I know, like I say, for other families it was as well. I think when we, we we'd heard the rumours that there was going to be certain conditions that were going to be shielding and then when you got the letter and it was there in black and white, um, I was my anxiety levels were through the roof. You know, what's going to happen? How am I going to look after Cajun? When we found out we were getting the food support from the govern government, it was a massive relief because I knew then that I didn't have to face going out. So it was it it made a huge difference to my life, just getting that food parcel every week and knowing that you didn't have to brave the shops. So yeah, that, it was a huge relief. Okay, awesome. Um, and then we've got another video to show you, to show you, so that's obviously like for a government department. Um, I know there's a lot of uh, more B2B or B2C customers. Um, and so this is for a, a client of ours, Message Space, who are more B2B um they're an advertising platform but they wanted to come up with some content that explained what they did um so a little bit more on that service side but was a bit more fun um and kind of uh, they have a very engaged online community um it's definitely more tongue-in-cheek that kind of content so when they came to kind of want to display their services they wanted to integrate that with the feeling of uh, the content that they already share and so this is um this is the message space video that we've uh, recently produced. How would you get a message to the Prime Minister? It's a question asked by businesses, campaigners and causes across the country. When so much depends on government policy, it's vital people at the top get your message. But when everyone is trying to get themselves noticed, how can anyone cut through the noise? That's where we come in. What if I told you that you can reach an audience of MPs, advisors, political influencers and stakeholders using just one specialist platform? What if I told you that some of the world's biggest companies, campaigners and causes use this platform to engage high value audiences right now? Don't go unnoticed. Partner with the Message Space Digital Politics Network. Get your message seen on the most influential news and current affair websites in the UK confirmed by independent pollsters as political insiders' favourite sources of daily news. Our 360 degree site of digital techniques engages users, inspires action and informs influencers. Partnering with the best, hottest sites in Westminster is guaranteed to deliver your message straight where you need it to be heard. Visit our website to find out more and get started today. How would you get a message? Awesome, so two very different types of videos there. Um, we're going to now hand over to Charlie Cooper-Smith, uh, but first let's run this poll. I will just launch it. Um, so Charlie Cooper-Smith uh, is our head of production. He oversaw the production of both of those. 
I have just launched the poll, so feel free to answer whilst um, whilst I'm talking. Uh, but yeah, so Charlie Houston oversaw the production of both of those, obviously two very different types of video. Um, there is the kind of government department and there is the uh, corporate client, but both trying to create content that people will genuinely engage with and genuinely share. Um, so Charlie's now going to talk about engaging content, um, shareable content, and uh, we'll talk about the difference between text-based uh, post graphics and video. So very interesting to see um, the results there. We've got most people, the majority of people, 63% usually post kind of graphics, picture-based um, picture based social media posts. Um, not many doing text-based and, and a couple of people using video. Um, so definitely interesting. Um, Charlie, I'll hand over to you. Okay, bro. James, thank you. Yeah. Right, great. Cheers, Tom. Um, yeah, so I'm going to be talking about uh, what is engaging content um, and discussing a little what sort of content you guys um, should look at putting out onto your social media accounts. Um, so what is engaging content? Well, traditionally, um, engaging content is, is um, content that has as much of an impact on your audience as possible um, and helps foster this idea of an online digital community um, and, and creates a dialogue directly with this community. We're at a position now where social media occupies such a large space um, on the internet and there's, there's so many users, it's such a mass audience that use it. I, I know there's a 145 million people use Twitter every single day. Um, 1.5 billion people use Facebook every single day. So as a business, um, you you're in this uh, position and you have this opportunity to, to directly communicate with such a large number of people on such a mass scale on a regular basis. And that's a really exciting position to be in. Um, Tom, I don't suppose you've gone to the next. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so then it comes down to what sort of content should you be putting out? Um, now, like I said, there's so many people using social media and, and people have uh, different interests and they engage with different uh, types of posts. So as a business or um, as a as a political um, uh, affiliate, it's, it's about trying to cut through that noise and try and uh, reach um, an audience as best you can. And one of the best ways to do this is um, this idea that Tom explored about uh, building an online community and engaging with them and, and creating a conversation and a regular dialogue with that community. So what I mean by this is not just plastering out, you know, um, social media posts, you know, set up your business and you've got a product, a product coming out. It's not just, hey, here's our new product, come and click here and, and, and engage and, and see if you can buy it or want to buy it. Or, um, you know, we've got a service, uh, here's an animation about our latest service. It's actually about trying to communicate with them and, and producing posts that they can directly engage with and that they can directly um, uh, or elicit uh, some feedback from them. So an example would be, let's say you're, uh, you've got this product coming out, you know, hey, we've got this really great product coming out. Here's four different colored versions of that product. You know, comment below what color you like best, or we've got this new product coming out, share this onto your social media, onto your stories, and um, for a chance to enter our giveaway. That's directly um, eliciting um, engagement from them. It's trying to generate a dialogue with them and communicate with them with directly. And, and, and trying to get them to feedback um, uh, uh, on, your, on your posts. So Tom, if you could go to the next one, please, mate. Yes. And the next one, sorry. Um, so then it comes down to, you know, what sort of content is king? Um, you know, it was quite interesting in that poll that a lot of you said graphics. Um, us as a digital agency would, would often always say that video content is king on social media. Um, this is because, you know, the analytics, um, as you can see on the screen there, they often suggest that video content engage, uh, um, generates the most engagement on social media. You know, um, I know on Facebook and Twitter, um, posts that involve animation or graphic content um, have, are 10 times more likely to be shared um, than posts that just contain text or link. Um, but video content is, is 20 times more likely to be shared um, around the social media space. Um, than content uh, or than posts that just have text um, or, or a link uh, based post. So that's, you know, it's a great example of how um, video content is, is, is really king on social media. But it's important to know that when coming to post onto your socials, um, that not, there's not one blanket content for all often. And that, um, you know, it's OK to, to post different types of things on different social media platforms. If you look at our social media platforms, for example, um, we post, we, we often post very different things on our Twitter as opposed to our Instagram. And that's because these uh, different platforms have different demographics 
on them and they, they've come to expect a certain type of content um, on those platforms. And so it's about understanding that. It's about when coming to post, it's about knowing who you're trying to reach and understanding what videos perform well on that platform and then honing in on that and getting your, getting your uh, uh, posts made. So Tom, if you go on to the next one for me. So I, I understand, obviously, you guys are all coming from a business point of view. So that so the main aim of the game is to try and generate conversions onto your site or wherever it might be. So I think the best way to look at it is like this, is that um, uh, if if your website uh, is the vehicle, you know, is, is the main vehicle for your inbound sales activity and your sales revenue, um, then engaging um, some targeted, efficient, engaging content should be considered the fuel that keeps that vehicle, the wheels on that vehicle turning. Um, you know, it's about communicating with them and trying to generate your voice on that platform and engaging regular content will increase your visibility on social media platforms. It will dramatically increase your visibility on search engines um, and it will uh, elicit this feedback from them that will ultimately generate um, some traffic onto your site. I mean, there's a great example of this is a company Gymshark, which are a, a fitness brand um, and they've done a great job at building this idea that Tom said of an online community, you know, that they know that their, their um, customers are, in, are into fitness. And so they regularly post stuff online about, you know, uh, workout routines or posting um, stuff about influencers and fitness influencers online. And uh, last year on their Black Friday, 79% of all of their sales on Black Friday came from clicks on their social media posts. Now, those posts weren't hey, it's Black Friday, I mean, a few other, hey, it's Black Friday, come and click here and, and um, join in on our discounts. It was actually um, using their, uh, their influencers that they have, that they know that their, um, their community engaged with to, you know, promote their, the latest, latest clothing, you know, what's in my wardrobe, that sort of thing, what I wear to the gym, that sort of thing. And that developed into 79% of all sales on that Black Friday. So that's a great example of how engaging this online community can really benefit um, you in your sales. Um, so to summarize all that, I think, it, um, you know, engaging content traditionally is um, content that has as big an imp impact on your audience as possible. Um, but the main key aim here is to try and develop this community and to regularly um, involve this community and communicate with them and create a dialogue. And so you can regularly put out content and you know that community will engage with it. Um, and that will just help to drive uh, traffic onto your site and your visibility on, on social media. Um, and on uh, um, on search engines. Awesome. Okay. Well, thank you very much, Charlie. And now we have another Charlie from our office, Charlie Messenger, um, who is one of our digital strategists, and he's going to talk about um, how the strategy around getting that content, getting that engagement content out to people. Uh, so, up oh, first, we have a poll. Um, how often do you post on social media? So, this is something that's um, obviously really important when thinking about digital strategy. Let me end this poll and launch the new one. So how often do you post on social media? Weekly, daily, uh, two to three times a day or more than three times a day? Um, if you want to get voting on that. Okay, awesome. A lot of active FIFA on social media. Brilliant, so it looks like uh, looks like a, a lot of people kind of weekly and daily posting on social media um, and a couple of people posting two to three times per day, um, which is great. Absolutely great. And Charlie's going to speak about how that fits um, into your digital strategy. So are you, you've got a video first, I believe. Yeah. Is that right? Slide. Okay, cool. Charlie's going to show you a video first. So this is a video that we produced uh, just before lockdown for the Adam Smith Institute um, with the Weatherspoons about freezing beer juices. So yes. if you want to fire it up. Pubs are at the heart of our communities. They're where we go for a Sunday roast, to relax after work and to enjoy ourselves on a night out. But every 12 hours, another pub shuts down in the United Kingdom. Over the last decade, 10,000 small pubs have closed their doors. The UK's outrageously high alcohol taxes are destroying small businesses, undermining our communities, and just making it more expensive to get a pint. We pay 68% of all wine tax in Europe and 40% of all beer tax. If you just take a standard pint, we pay 58 pence in beer tax compared to the Germans or the Spanish who only pay five pence. But that's not all. 
G'day, mate. What can I get you? A pint of brew dog, please. Julia thinks she's getting her money's worth. The tax man has his eyes on her pint. A shocking one third of every pound you spend in a pub goes to the tax man. Meanwhile, the excise on beer is set to rise by another 12% over the next four years, costing beer drinkers another 408 million pounds. If the government wants to stop the stream of closing pubs and save our communities, they need to stop strangling them with ever higher taxes. Come on, Bruno, let's go to the pub. Awesome. Okay, so cool. So uh, we're going to take that video as a case study per se. Um, so when creating a neutral strategy, there are several things you really need to bear in mind. And probably the most important one of those things is just the assumption that everyone has a short attention span. That's a really key premise to work off when building a digital strategy. So in order to work with that, you need to make sure the content is really engaging and snappy because people don't just want to sort of sit and, uh, you know, people aren't basically going to sit and engage with really dull and mundane content. So the best way to maximize engagement, yeah, is with a short and snappy content. Um, so an effective way to do that is engaging with current online trends. So that video that we just did there, we looked at what sort of stuff really works well on Twitter, um, because that's where this video was predominantly going to be targeted at. Um, so we really tapped into, to an extent, meme culture and, you know, trends that are popular on uh, Twitter with Politica, you know, the, the, the average person on Twitter who's got a vested interest in politics, that's who this video was really targeted at. Um, so we stylistically chose the you know, fonts that we use. We use some Comic Sans. Um, I think it pops up saying now with added, ta added tax, that was in Comic Sans because we knew it's kind of like a, it's a popular font to hate on the internet. Um, we had people popping up out of, you know, flicking the notes everywhere because we knew that's very much in keeping with uh, online viral trends. Um, so we used this idea of a, uh, internet quirky meme culture to basically try and cut across quite a serious uh, political message. And it worked really well. It went down an absolute storm on Twitter. It had a few hundred thousand views, I think. It was actually uh, liked and retweeted by various politicians, uh, including but not limited to Nigel Farage, who obviously wasn't at all who we were targeting this video at. Um, and you know, we don't necessarily agree with his standpoints and views, but he himself has got 3 million followers on Twitter. So Nigel Farage seeing that video, retweeting it, that's potential for another 3 million people to watch the video, click the link that was linked to, uh, the, the, that was in the tweet, uh, look at the Adam Swift Twitter page. So it's like a whole myriad of responses that come from basically tapping into what's quite a serious market you know, politics and public affairs is a serious market and people don't often associate that sort of stuff with um, viral content. So if you go in there with uh, a message that's, it's still serious and it's making a you know, standard political point, but it's in a really fun and upbeat, quirky left field, uh, ex you know, it's executed in a really left field and quirky way, then people are going to engage with that really well because it stands out. Um, since then, we've we've done a lot of content with the Adam Smith Institute in particular, and we've basically aimed at uh, keeping their content consistent, but not the same. So that means that all their content is uh, it's all original, it's quirky, it's all left field, but it's it's all original. Each piece is different from the next, and people have come to associate that. Uh, people come to associate them, the brand, as this sort of quirky personality on the internet, which again is occupying a really unique field in public affairs. Um, because like I say, public affairs tends to be quite blank face serious. Uh, I think people really look for brands to connect with on the social media if that brand is voicing a certain personality. As Tom mentioned, Burger King, the brand, um, hired, I think they've got a third party social media affairs agency that run all of their socials. They ended up having, I think in 2018, the most liked tweet of all time on Twitter, which was just a simple response. I think Kanye West tweeted out saying that his, uh, his favorite restaurant is McDonald's and Burger King responded saying, well, that tells you everything you need to know. And I think it ended up having something like just shy of a million likes and retweets. And it's such a simple but effective way 
of engaging with consumers on social media because it looked like this brand all of a sudden had a personality. It wasn't just a corporate, you know, slap occupying a space on the internet. It was, it felt like a person. Um, so that's really worth bearing in mind when you're looking at making content is how can it be unique and original while still getting across your message. Um, so I think once this content is consistently put out in this manner, you've consistently got original content that's somewhat out of the box. Uh, you know, it, it, it's somewhat original, it's maybe a little bit quirky, or I guess that depends on the market you're targeting, but it needs to really stand out from what everyone else is doing. So you look at what your rivals or competitors are doing and see, see what works well what works best and can you capitalize on that? Can you add your own set of twists to that? And I think once, once you start routinely putting out that quality original content that's unique, that's when you can look at building an exponential following and in turn that will feed into your goals, be it building an online community um, or directing clicks and so on and so on. Absolutely. And um, that's, that's really a kind of, brings us towards the end of what we're talking about but just to just to close off and before we move to the q a um it's like fantastic i mean i know charlie Coop smith has spoken about uh engaging content and charlie has just spoken about uh, a bit of digital strategy but all of this is about how can you better build an online following so that people come to you as charlie messenger was saying um you know you can reach out to other you know other communities similar to the one that you want to build um, you can go and retweet and like people's uh, posts. You can create engaging content, new content for people to respond to. Um, and all of that is part of building this online community. Um, that's what the most successful brands like Gymshark or Boo Boo um, or Burger King have done on social media is, is create this online community. Um, so we now move on to the Q&A part. I can see we've got a question already. Uh, uh, let's see what's the best way to open this. Um, hmm. I don't have the. If you hit escape. Yeah, I think we might have to come back to ourselves in full screen. Here we go. Here's the Q and A. What's the best social media platform for posting uh, unique, quirky content, in your opinion? Okay, interesting. Um, Should I answer? That's just, yeah, yeah, go for it. I'd, I think quirky and unique content uh, really goes down a storm on Twitter because Twitter has got the shareable option that perhaps Facebook and Instagram don't capitalize on so much. So obviously retweeting is a big one. Um, quite often tweets can end up exponentially blowing up. Um, so I think if you're looking at quirky and original content, definitely try and tap into that on Twitter. And also it's it's easy because that content, yes, it can be, uh, you know, fun videos and animations and pictures or whatever, but it can also, like I said, the Burger King tweet was, it was just a simple like one words, you know, one sentence reply to Kanye West and that really blew up. Um, so definitely Twitter because it doesn't take a lot to routinely post on there. It's not like you have to carefully think what's going on the Twitter today. You can just engage engage with uh, customers and current trends very easily there. That's it. And that's, that's what we, when we talk about social media um, as being active and reactive, um, it's okay to not, um, you know, to, to kind of go with the flow and see what's trending that day and to kind of jump on the back of that. And actually that's going to be really good when you're trying to engage this online community. Um, because you have to remember on social media, you're not just trying to you know, cut through against your competitors, but you're trying to cut through against the, John Lewis Christmas advert or, um, you know, a picture of a cat on a skateboard. Um, and so it's, it's really important to, um, to kind of think about how you can be both active and reactive. Uh, we've got another question in the Q and A and do keep sending these in. We've got about 10 minutes, um, to be able to ask these questions. So do keep sending them in. Um, should I be using paid Facebook or Twitter adverts for my posts? So this is a question we get a lot. We do um, a lot of campaigns where we use a kind of mixture of um, organic, uh, like or organic content and paid content. Um, so Facebook, the Facebook platform and the Twitter platform both have um, great advertising platforms for targeting. 
Um, what we see a lot of uh, in terms of mistakes that companies make or, or um, departments have made in the past is that they want to get a message out. So they post something, put loads of money behind it um, to boost it, and then say, oh, look, we got a better than normal uh, engagement. Well, yes, but actually that's not the most successful way to use um, like the boost function on Facebook or, or, or Twitter. Um, realistically, what you want to do is be creating content. The content is the key. Um, content that people want to share anyway, because like Charlie said, then you get that exponential um, kind of reach. Um, so create content that, that people want to see anyway, and then you can use the boost functions um, to, uh, to kind of elevate that a little bit. Um, in terms of like dark ads, so kind of ca uh, advertising campaigns that aren't boosts on your posts. So this is more looking at Facebook. Um, we use them for like very targeted campaigns. So whether that be geographically targeted or um, for demographically targeted or interest based, we you know can use any of those sorts of sort of metrics to work out exactly who is the most receptive audience. Um, and yeah, absolutely can be very, very um, useful in terms of in terms of targeting very specific people. Um, so that's that one. Right, we've got a couple more questions. In terms of creating an effective piece of content, could you run us through the planning and production process? Yeah. Yeah, um, I know we're actually going to go into this in, in a lot more depth on Friday, on, on our webinar on Friday. Um, so I'll keep this one uh, relatively brief. But um, if you came to us as a digital agency and said, you know, we want to start uh, producing content, um, how do we go about doing that? The first thing we would do would be to ask who it is you're trying to reach. You know, what is that key demographic that you're trying to reach and establish that because Again, naturally, different demographics react differently to certain types of content. Um, and then it would be looking at what uh, platforms that you primarily operate on. You know, is it Instagram, um, Facebook or Twitter? Um, and, and, and seeing what, uh, what platforms you, you operate on most and, and what content works well on those platforms. And, and then it's about your key message and what it is you're trying to, to, to get across. Um, is it just, you know, uh, promoting a new product? Um, is it, you know, an event that you've got coming up or is it you're just trying to get your name out there and build this online community? Um, all of that uh, feeds into it because, you know, different types of content lend themselves to different outcomes. Um, so once those three questions are established, then it's just about um, planning out videos and we'd, we'd go into a storyboarding phase. We'd look at like Chaz tapped into the online trends and what works currently and start to, to um, build, whether it be a video, graphic, animation, whatever it might be, using um, our knowledge and, and what we know about the social online trends and how that works to try and build um, and to generate uh, your content for you. So that's, that's a very brief breakdown of the process that we would use. Um, if you came to us um, looking to, to produce content. Absolutely. And as you said, um, we're going to be talking about that. We have another webinar on Friday. Um, so do join that because that's going to be talking about specifically working with digital agencies, kind of the procurement process, um, how to kind of get your ideas best across to a digital agency, um, and a little bit actually about targeting and um, targeted campaigns. Uh, there's another question, uh, really interesting. So I use Instagram mostly as a very visual business uh, addresses. What's your opinion of Instagram stories as opposed to actual Instagram posts? I haven't managed to master stories yet. So this is really interesting. Um, and as Charlie was kind of touching on earlier, um, people engage with, uh, or, or people engage with videos, graphics, uh, text-based posts um, differently. Um, the reason for that is all of the Instagram platforms have an algorithm for how they show your content. So Instagram actually, uh, I know you've spoken about posts and stories, but Instagram right now are pushing Instagram reels. So that's a maximum 30 second video. Um, they're actually pushing that so much that a lot of the clients we're working with um, are getting viewership higher than the amount of followers they have. So we have a, a client with uh, 85,000 followers they put, uh, we've been testing out some reels and been getting about 120,000 views um, consistently. So definitely I'd look into Instagram reels as something right now. Those algorithms are always changing. Um, stories are great because it's quick, easy to use content. You can really consistently get it up um, and, it, and it's so easy to create. Um, you know, you can be very responsive in that, even just sharing uh, things that other people are doing. Again, trying to create that community. Um, and, and stories are, 
it's like really past that community. If you look at the brands we've spoken about, Gymshark, Burger King, Boohoo, um, the Broad Academy, they're always putting kind of stories up such that their community know that every time they go onto the Instagram app, there is something for them to watch, right? Even if it's not an actual post, there's just a, a story for them to watch for, they might only watch three seconds, seven seconds, 10, you know, they might watch all 10 seconds of a story. Um, but definitely Instagram stories are a great way to, uh, to connect with your online community and help build your online community. Um, oh, we've got one more just come in and would we'll potentially take this as the last one. Um, what are the fast and gro fastest growing social medias currently? Uh, right, so in terms of social media platforms, uh, TikTok is rapidly growing. We haven't seen a huge amount from um, corporates and how corporates are going to use that yet. Um, but TikTok is definitely growing in the younger demographic. Um, in terms of daily active users, Facebook has kind of like peaked really. Uh, there's about you know, one in four people in the world are daily active users on Facebook, which is ridiculous. Um, but it's the, the, obviously the growth rate then is slightly uh, steeper. Instagram is still growing. Twitter is actually um, still growing. So um, I would say if you're looking for something to jump on early, if you think you can um, use it, try TikTok. I know it's something we've tried with a few of our clients, um, but certainly Instagram. Um, Instagram and Twitter are fast growing. Um, they're, the amount of daily active users they have are rapidly rapidly increasing uh, and we just have one more question please can you quickly recommend a great and easy app for creating diy busy video content yeah so in terms of quick and easy video content um we i mean do you do you suggest one. yeah yeah so i think there's one called adobe uh, i think it's called adobe rush it's free to download uh it's easy to master but you can do an awful lot on that mm. that's what we use quite a lot of um, if we're doing more content that's going out on our socials, you know, it's just filmed on a phone and it's going on our Instagram mm. stories, whatever. Uh, Adobe Rush is, is as far as free apps go that you can download. That's that's a real winner. And that's it. And even as a, a digital agency ourselves, we obviously a huge production um, capacity in house. We often say to clients, you know, if you're on the spot and you're wanting to create something quickly. Um, do just put something up from your mobile phone. Your social media was designed to use the mobile phone. Um, so use that. And we really come in, a lot of our campaigns are to complement the work that your in-house digital teams or whether you don't have an in-house digital team or digital person to complement that um, and complement that offering. So yeah, um, Adobe Rush is great when you have slightly more serious campaigns or whether you want to drip feed more professional content. Um, that's when you probably want to look at working with a digital agency. And that's exactly what we'll be talking about next week. So uh, next week, now on Friday, sorry. So please do join us on Friday, this Friday, um, to talk about working with digital agencies. And I think that wraps us up for today. So thank you very much. As I say, do join us on Friday. And uh, yeah, we've been Westminster Digital.